Hey guys, what's up? This is Thomas Bird with Tabletop Life. Today is the first episode of our Academy series. We're going to be talking about terrain. Terrain, terrain, terrain. That's a big deal in Ninth Edition. They really come back and put a lot of terrain rules into the book. And uh, as we've gone to tournaments and really looked at how people interpret the terrain, we've really seen terrain comes in all shapes and sizes, even more so than it ever used to be. We really kind of, once we leave our local area, it's a mixed bag on what you're going to get. So really, I want to talk about the different types of terrain and then go through this whole series. There's going to be six episodes in this series talking about everything terrain, how to place it, what types there are, things to look out for when you go to tournaments, all those things. So um, if you're new to the channel, we're going to be doing these series uh, along with our hobby series and our pro series for playing. So there's a lot of different types of content. So definitely go check out some of our other videos if you want to know more about playing this game. So today, uh, this video is talking about the two main types of terrain that you'll see at tournaments. Uh, we have preset terrain and we have player place terrain. Um, so a lot of pros and cons for each type. Uh, sometimes you'll see different groups mix and match. Maybe they'll have mostly preset and then they'll mix in a little bit of player place. Um, sometimes they're preset the entire game and then they'll, uh, or others, they'll change them to be a preset for each mission. So really you have to know going into the tournament, if you're playing the player tournament, what they have for the terrain, what it looks like, how are they doing terrain, if they're setting it up. Because there's a lot of thought that goes into it, both from a pre-place perspective and from a, a player place perspective. Preset terrain. Uh, and, and when I say preset terrain, I mean, when you go to the event, the, the TOs, the tournament organizers, they're going to put the terrain on the table for you, or they're going to have a diagram for you to put it up for them. But everything is going to be preset, pre-measured. All the terrain is going to be in a fixed location. And so there's a couple pros and there's a couple cons that kind of go with that. The big pros is like the train's already set up. There's no time extra spent setting it up at the beginning. Now that sometimes can be not the case. If, if you change it per mission, you may have to go and follow their little cheat sheet on how to set it up. So there's sometimes a little, that kind of goes backwards when you start comparing the two. But usually you know, your, your time saved on the front end, you have a, a clear understanding of what the train is before you go to the event. Sometimes the tournament organizers, if it's a large tournament or the TOs are very organized, they might pr publish a guide to the different terrain sets. So I know WTC, uh, they uh, they have a lot of preset terrain rules and you know, the notes, so you can go study that terrain and understand what you're going to be going into and playing against and knowing all the different terrain types. Sometimes you'll just get there and you'll know that that's all the terrain is going to be symmetrical on all the tables. The other big thing is, you know, there's less time for you when you go into that to set up your army because you've kind of thought about it, hopefully, and you know, hey, my army from a playing perspective, I know how it wants to play. I know how it wants to deploy. So I'm not really kind of paying that much attention to my opponent's setup because I'm doing the same thing every time. I've kind of pre-studied and I'm ready to go. Um, negatives, let's talk about some of the negatives about it. In that same vein, I always know what I'm going to do and I know what armies play well. So depending on what type of terrain there is, what kind of line of sight there, blocking there is, it tends to favor certain armies more than others. You don't kind of have that player placed perspective where you can adjust the terrain based on your matchup and your opponent. You're really kind of saying, well, the terrain is set. And if, uh, if it's measured a certain distance from the center, I might be at a high assault element there. If the train is really open on objectives, I would have to have really hard durable units to go on an objective or those types of things are you know, in consideration when you build your army. So when you actually go to the event, you'll see a lot of like the top players, their army is built specific. They're not just taking the same army that they take to every event. They are taking a specific army for that specific train. And sometimes I've seen really top players be like, mm, that train's not really great. I don't really even want to go because it's just, you know, either my army doesn't work or it's just going to lead to too many random variables that they don't want to control. So um, some pros, some cons. Going into player place train, uh, which we kind of use here, um, there's a lot more that goes into it. There's a lot of misconceptions that go into it, but there's there's some really goods and there's also some negatives there. So uh, let's talk about the negatives first. There is a, the, 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 the I'm got to set things up at the beginning of the game. There's some time spent moving the pieces around, explaining what the pieces are. Um, learning the rules, if you have not got the pre-published rules of how you place, there are rules for how you put the pieces down. 
and a sequence and an order of operations. So there's a little bit of time spent there. Uh, kind of as we've learned it, it takes less than two minutes if you're really, you know, once you've done it a few times, you kind of know the basics. So you can mess up in terrain. That's the next negative is you're playing a new game. It's a little mini game that you have to play before the game starts. Terrain is so important in ninth edition. The way objectives are placed, the way armies move, you have so little time in the game with a fixed five turns that if you're not positioning a train in a certain way for your army or to defend against your opponent's army, you could potentially lose the game in pre setup. So it bears some thinking about how the train goes. But if you set it up poorly or you're playing a person who's very inexperienced at setting up the train, um, you could potentially win the game by on their mistakes, right? So people sometimes have a bad feeling about that if they've set the train up and they realize now they're at a big disadvantage. So that's a big negative. Again, that's kind of being prepared for player place terrain. That's playing through it a few times, understanding it. If you walk into it first time and you have not studied it and you're playing against somebody who plays player place all the time, you're at a clear disadvantage. But that's the same with any kind of Warhammer event you go to. If, if you don't know their army and they played your army a hundred times every, every day uh, on Friday nights, you're at a big disadvantage, right? So that just goes into knowing your army, knowing your terrain, knowing the event that you're going to some positives we kind of talked a little bit about it but the terrain when you get to play against your opponent now really matters and then understanding what their army does and understanding what you do you have some uh, flexibility on how you place the train if i have a really shooty army and you don't you have a really assaulty army you're going to try to place terrain where you're going to block lanes of fire so i can't shoot you're going to put objectives where there's ruins nearby where you can hide behind that ruin. You're going to place ruins in the center so that you can have jumping points to now assault me. And so um, the, the big thing about it is unless I let you by placing my pieces poorly, we're kind of fighting back and forth, right? There's a give and take, right? So the, at the end of the day, we both do our jobs right. Neither of us is going to be happy, but we're both going to have some pieces that are good for our army. And that gives us some chance in the game to kind of balance out some of those inequities. Sometimes you get to a table like that is a bad matchup. But if you can somehow make the terrain a little bit in your favor, you have some control over it, right? So that that's some that's some pretty good positives, right? And and at the end of the day, you're trying to play a game. You're trying not to get blown up and killed on the first turn. You're spending a lot of time and effort. You want to give yourself as much option and op opportunity as possible. All right, now let's dive into some example terrain setups. Uh, let's look at this table and talk about how many pieces is enough. Um, that question goes round and round. There's lots of uh, commentary on how many pieces enough. Certainly coming back from 8th edition to 9th edition, the number of pieces seems to have gone up dramatically. But depending on how you build those pieces, if you're using a lot of pieces from 8th edition, where you had a lot of kind of large ruins, maybe the, the footprint on the piece was so large because you really only as a tournament organizer could have four to six pieces for, for tables, right? You know, if you have 100 tables, that's, you know, 400, 600 pieces, right? You got to store and deal with. That's a that's a big logistical challenge, right? Now you're moving to, I have 10, I have 15, I have 20 pieces of train. Where, where's that all going to go? And you multiply that by 100 tables. You can understand the issue with just like, hey, let's just go dump all of our train or like triple it. But if you use large pieces with large area pieces, uh, large footprints, it limits how you place the other pieces, right? And then with the restriction now in ninth edition that you can't put objectives inside a train, it also limits how you set up the train on, on any given map. Since the deployment zone and the objective missions change so frequently, you're not really putting out your own objectives, they're fixed in the mission. It really makes um, the train and how many pieces drastically change depending on the footprint, the size, the types of terrain that tournament organizers use. So let's take a look here. There's no right or wrong answer, though I guess we can always say, we can identify if there's not enough. Like we can, we can definitely say that's not enough. Let's look at a piece of, a couple example boards and see, you know, is this too much? Is this too little? Are there the right mix of, of terrain? Cause you could have 20 pieces, but they could be all the wrong 20 pieces. Now looking at this example, again, we have 10 pieces of terrain. We have four ruins four kind of container line of sight blocking type pieces and two forests. Again, we're really looking at coverage and number of pieces of terrain, different types of terrain that make a good board. This particular mission layout may not be ideal for every single mission. So just kind of keep that in mind. We're really thinking about how many pieces do I need on a good uh, ninth edition table? 
what types of terrain and the mix. So this is a good example of a good mix of pieces of terrain. All right, so here we are with an example of a, a good amount of terrain. So we placed this terrain. We're looking at, here we have six, eight ruins, two forests and two containers. So 10 large pieces, but we still have a good mix of coverage across the board for all the different deployment types. All right, so what we have here is an example of a balanced table. So you have a decent amount of terrain covering the entirety of the board, a good mix of line of sight blocking and physical movement blocking, right? And so this terrain is kind of set up evenly. You can definitely see this as a preset board where you can, even though you have different deployment zones, it would still give you coverage from many different angles. So it's a very good example of a balanced board. All right, guys, so here's an example of preset terrain where we think it's not enough. So if you look at the board, same roughly amount of pieces as the balance board, but look at the lines of sight. And especially if you think about how the map may change for the different deployment zones, if you're in a hammer and anvil, if you're in a dawn of war, if you're in a diagonal deployment, core deployment, lots of lanes that are open, not a lot of good places to hide, very inefficient use of terrain. This is not what we would recommend. All right, guys, here you can take a look at a table that is too much terrain. Now, I could see some people saying if they have a really assault heavy army, they love this terrain. But in general, this is not a good piece of terrain setup because there's just too many pieces of ruins. There's too many line of sight blockers. It really favors one army type over another. This is not balanced. This is not what you want to see. If, you're, if your armies are playing on this, you're definitely going to see the terrain factor into the games quite heavily. All right, in this last part of the video, we want to go back and look at objectives and how terrain interacts with them. So while it's definitely not okay to put the objective inside of the terrain piece, there's nothing that says the three inch marker or three inches extending from the, you know, the 40 millimeter, millimeter objective marker doesn't can't extend into that, that terrain piece. So what we definitely see, like if you if you just use like poker chips or little coins as your objective markers, that's not an issue. I can I make sure those aren't in the terrain pieces. I'm fine. But when we, we see like the neoprene mats, the seven, you know, seven and a half inch wide neoprene mats where it's kind of clear, I'm on that mat, I'm getting on the objective, I know. Well, people kind of have taken that, you can't put objectives inside of a ruin to kind of mean that 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 neoprene mat, that seven and a half inch can't extend into a, a, a terrain piece, which is not the case, right? It's just that 40 millimeter center um, that can't go in there. But those extra pieces, the extra three inches or so can overhang into a ruin. And then when you're building terrain, especially if you're doing player place, you definitely want to set that up. Sometimes you want it to overlap so it's on, on both sides of a, of a ruin or a wall. So it kind of gets you an advantage. So definitely want to clarify that. That's a big deal when you're looking at terrain. And when you're looking at preset terrain, how they're setting it up and how they're dealing with those objectives. Sometimes you'll just see a poker chip. Sometimes you'll see that, that seven and a half inch pre, you know, neoprene mat that kind of shows where the objective and its control zone is. Um, it's important to understand, you know, where those two intersect and how that interacts with the terrain. And so as you talk through those examples, you can kind of see it's not always advantageous for those objectives to be right out in the open or right behind a wall. It could really balance certain armies or favor certain armies uh, much more than the others. So you've got to think about it when you're placing terrain or when you're seeing preset terrain, is that objective, is that terrain piece going to help an assault army? Is it going to help a shooting army? Um, can I use that, leverage that for my army or can I you know, use that for my opponent's army? Thanks for watching episode one of our Academy series on terrain. Hope you learned a lot about what Knife Edition brings to terrain. And as you go into these tournaments and you want to play, or just as you think about terrain for your own local area, what those different things are, pro preset terrain versus player place terrain, lots to think about. Join us next time as we go into episode two of the series where we go more in depth on player place terrain, the rules that we use here in Atlanta, and the 10 do's and don'ts of terrain for player place terrain. So don't miss that. If you like what you've seen here, hit that like button, hit that notification. You'll be notified when we put out the next video and we'll see you next time. Thanks guys.